boys and girls, King's kids. Today's story is called Son of Laughter. And what a great topic to talk about laughter. When I think of laughter, I think of this scene in the Mary Poppins movie where Uncle Albert starts to laugh. And you've got to look it up if you've never seen it before. It's great. And the song is all, all about different kinds of laughter. What kind of laugh do you have? Maybe you have different laughs for different things. How about... <laughs> what kind of laugh is that? It's kind of quiet. You just don't want to have people know that you're laughing. How about this one? Do you know of anybody that laughs like that? It's almost like a snake sound, isn't it? How about... <laughs> that's kind of like a giggle. Little girls like to giggle. And that's very contagious. I remember when my little girl, Lindsay, started her giggles. We'd all start to giggle because we just couldn't help it. How about... Somebody tells you a joke and you, and it's not that funny and you go, <laughs> that's kind of like a, well, telling the person, it's not a great joke, but anyways, I'll laugh. Or somebody tells you a joke and you don't get it, but you pretend you get it and you go, <laughs> oh, yeah. So what kind of laughter do you have? Now, the story. Let's get to the story. The story is about, well, you know what? I'll let you see for yourself, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, enjoy. Son of Laughter. Years passed, and things didn't get any better. People were still just as cruel and mean to one another. They still got sick and died. God's world was still full of tears. It was never meant to be like this. But God was getting ready to do something about it. He was going to make all the wrong things right, and he was going to do it through a family. Abraham, God said, how many stars are there? God was about to tell his friend a wonderful secret. Uh, let me see, um, Abraham said, rolling up his sleeves. But have you ever tried counting stars? <laughs> then you know how hard it is. Uh, 993, 994, 997, uh-oh, uh, 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 no, wait, uh, uh, one, two... Well, of course, he kept losing count. Too many, he said. Guess what? God laughed. I will give you so many children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, you won't be able to count them either. Abraham couldn't help giggling at such a wonderful idea, but he stopped himself. How could he have a family? Don't be silly. He didn't have any children, let alone grandchildren. He wiped away a tear. Anyway, it was far too late for him to start having babies at his age. He was 99 years old. What could God mean? Abraham, God said, believe me. And then God told Abraham his secret rescue plan. Abraham, I will make your family very big, God promised, until one day your family will come to number more than even all the stars in the sky. Abraham looked up at the dark night sky, thick with stars. You will be my special family, my people, and through you everyone on earth will be blessed. It was an incredible promise. God was going to rescue the world through Abraham's family. One of his great, great, great grandchildren would be the child, the promised one, the rescuer. Oh, but it's too wonderful, Abraham said. How can it be true? Is anything too good to be true? 
God asked, is anything too wonderful for me? So Abraham trusted what God said, more than what his eyes could see, and he believed. Now when Abraham's wife Sarah heard God's promise, she just laughed to herself. But it wasn't a happy laugh. It had tears in it. She had always wanted a baby. Could her dream come true? Could she really have a baby when she was 90 years old? No, of course not. Don't be silly. It was far too late. See, Sarah didn't believe God could do what he promised. She had forgotten that when God says something, it's as good as done. Of course it was as easy for God to give her a baby son as it was for him to make all the stars in the sky. And sure enough, nine months later, just as God had promised, Sarah gave birth to a baby boy. They named him Isaac, which means son of laughter. And Sarah laughed. But this time it was a glorious, happy laugh. Her dream had come true. God would do as he promised. He would always look after Abraham's family, his special people. And one day, God would send another baby. A baby promised to a girl who didn't even have a husband. But this baby would bring laughter to the whole world. This baby would be everyone's dream come true. So what did you think of that story? It happened many, many years ago. What a beautiful story. And I love how God came in a time where there was many tears. People were mean to each other, cruel. Times were dark, but God knows how to bring his love and his joy and his laughter into a very, very dark situation. And he uses the most incredible ways of doing that. Ways that we can't even imagine and ways that we need to show our trust that he can do it. And in these ways, we can see that it's only God that can do it. So God brought Abram and Sarah much joy in their old age in bringing Isaac to them. And Isaac was named the son of laughter. And through all of these people, these generations, God brought his promise, his rescuer, Jesus, to earth to rescue us from our sin. And we do need rescuing, don't we? We live in a world that does not know God. And there's a lot of sin and a lot of sadness. But knowing Jesus brings us joy. Knowing that he has come to rescue us brings us joy and laughter. And we need to spread that joy to others. Ask God to show you of ways you can bring joy to other people's faces and into their lives. Have a great week. I love you all. Bye. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my blessed redeemer way down in my So we give away down in the depths of my heart
Well, good evening, uh, or if you're watching during the day, good good day, good morning, whatever it may be. We are uh, we're super glad to have you joining us. I want to say thanks to my mother-in-law Liz for that awesome kids ministry video you just saw, and uh, grateful grateful for our kids ministry workers, grateful for our team, grateful for you uh, tuning in online. That's uh, what we have to do at this point. Here we are again in, uh, you know, in a, in a lockdown once uh, once more, and so uh, we're just going to do our best to be the church uh, wherever we may find ourselves. So hopefully uh, you've had some time just to prepare your heart, uh, because we gather to to worship Him. We gather in His name. We gather to celebrate family stuff too. Uh, that's who we are as Kingsway. You know, one big family. And so, a couple. Uh, well, I think we only have one announcement actually, and that's the fact that Zane is 21. Woo! Zane is 21 today. <laughs> Happy birthday, Zane! And yes, ladies, he is available. So just uh, you can put it in the live chat or whatever. We'll hook you up. That's how you have to find a date during COVID. So uh, we are uh, glad that Zane is a part of our family, man. That kid has done, I mean, that young man, that fine young man has done a lot uh, for, uh, for this church, for, uh, for the, even for making sure these live streams happen. Um, you know, t- tonight as we prepare our hearts to, uh, to worship him, I, I shared something last week with our uh, in the room crowd, and I wanted to share that with our online group as well. And it's the lyrics from a song called Is He Worthy, written by, I forget the guy's name, Andrew Peterson, I think, and uh, sung by a bunch of different people. But here's the, uh, here's the lyrics, and I just, you know, just encourage you to, to ponder these uh, as we prepare our hearts for, for worship to, um, today. It says, do you feel the world is broken? And the answer is we do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? It's the lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He was David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. You know, does the father truly love us? He does. Does the spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? He does. And does our God intend to dwell with us? He does. Just finishes with, is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom this slave. From every people and tribe, from every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the son. And the question is, is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing, of all honor and all glory? Is he worthy? In your homes right now, where if you're watching or listening uh, while you're driving, is he worthy of all of this? Man, maybe just a resounding yes, he is. Let's uh, take a moment to uh, worship him tonight together uh, in song. Hey everyone, excited to be here as always. Um, just wanted to share something really quick with everyone. I, I, a, a long time ago, um, West of Rees was here and he spoke um, and he talked about storing the word in your heart and in your mind so that you could bring it out. And, and so he planted that seed in us to to, um, rem- to, to read through the, the Bible and to put plant those verses and those readings into our hearts and minds. And not long ago, Mark did the same thing. And the other day I was I was really struggling and I was driving down to the end of the road and all of a sudden those words, the words that I had started to learn in Matthew had popped into my head. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got it, you know, and he's got you. Um, and so just I'm just going to read really quickly Matthew 6. Just that first piece or that piece that relates to that and it's uh, from Matthew 6. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, therefore do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And just really quickly wanted to share one more. In Exodus, really, really cool. We did it this week in Bible study. 
And just the words that sat with me in this particular verse in a parenting Bible study we were doing was, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. And those words have just been playing in my mind all week. So I just encourage you to, to remember that that, that that is, that sows in your heart and in your mind and, and even just in our songs and our worship. So would you worship with us? So grateful to be here worshiping with you, worshiping our Father. Glory. 
We take all the worries of this world, Father, and we lay them, lay them at your feet. Surrendering every anxious thought for your perfect peace. Perfect. 
Just grateful for the words of this song, Father. We can just truly cast our cares on you. For many of us, Lord, that list is long. That list is long. Lord, the cares of uh, things we're going through in our own lives, the things that others are going through, the just our, our heart for the world and those around us. God, thank you that your love is greater, that your shoulders are large, that your goodness is never ending, that your mercy follows me, that your truth, your truth stands you are worthy to be praised, worthy to be praised. Jesus, I thank you for what you did for us on the cross. So we just consider that day <laughs> that was planned since before the world was formed, that you loved us so much that you, you do whatever it took to restore relationship. We're just glad to be in relationship with you. Thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus. May our lives be a worthy, a worthy reward for the price that you paid. May our worship tonight bless you, bring a smile to your face. And Holy Spirit, thank you for living in us. Thank you that we can hear, hear your voice deep down inside. Sometimes it's just those unctions, but we just know we need to be listening for you. God, would you help my Kingsway? friends and family tonight to hear your voice. Lord, would you, uh, I just pray help me to hear it too, to be led by you to say what you desire. <laughs> God, we just take this minute to open ourselves to you, wide open to you. We need you, Lord. We need you. <laughs> Ask all these things in the name above every name. Powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, musicians. Thank you, team. It's just me and the camera tonight. And a few others. Oh, and the band. Uh, just, um, <clears throat> I'm just grateful to be a part of this Kingsway family. I, I, it, <laughs> it just never grows old. We've been through a lot together, and I believe we still have lots to uh, go through together uh, with our amazing Savior. And, um, you know, for those who don't know me, my name is Mark, uh, and, and I'm, I'm grateful that you're tuning in for whatever reason it may be. Maybe somebody sent you this link, or maybe you just happened to end up here today. There's no, there's no accident in that. Uh, he, we believe he leads and directs our lives on purpose. Um, last week, you know, <laughs> last week was, uh, oh, I, I tried watching it myself, and it was, uh, for those watching online, that, that, that was probably a little difficult. Um, for those who haven't watched it, um, I'd say don't. Yeah. <laughs> last uh, last week, I simply had took the chance to share, you know, a, a heart to heart with our Kingsway family, and I was grateful to those who uh, reached reached out to me this week. Uh, that's what I mean. I just I just truly love our family, and, and you know, a couple of my a couple of my favorite responses were one person said, you know, you should cry all the time because I remembered the whole message as a result. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, not going to happen. You know, actually, my daughter asked me on the way out tonight. She's like, Dad, did you get enough sleep this week? And I was like, no. And she's like, well, it looks like we're going to be getting more care packages this week. And so to those who send care packages, by the way, uh, that was excellent. I, and uh, so thank you. Thank you for that. I was really blessed by the scriptures of encouragement. When you send the word to me, man, it was like, it, 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 it's like it lights up on the inside and brings strength on the inside. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Some of you are praying scripture over me. Super thankful for that. You know, I would encourage you to do that for others because uh, his word is living and powerful and active and mighty and uh, bears fruit in our lives. You know, but some of the ones that really got me were the ones where that reached out that I haven't talked to in a long time. And they're just like, you know what? I, I got, <laughs> after that, I just, I know that I got to get back to church. 
just the Holy, Holy Spirit drawing on people's lives and saying, you know, come back to me. This life that we're living right now, it matters so, so much. And I know last week there was a lot of tears, and it truly was tears because of um, just a, an emotional overload, lack of sleep. Some people were worried, like, I'm having a mental breakdown. I, I'm good. Um, my tears were truly for our church and for the lost and for, for just that burden that I have that it just appears that people are wandering without, you know, aimlessly without direction right now in their lives that they're following the uh, they're following the the sway of culture and uh, to me that is it's it's it was grievous enough to to weep publicly. I was hoping we could do a retake and post it, but we did not have the time. So, you know, in January I, I shared a message at the very beginning of the year called Lockdown Living, and I'd encourage you to take a listen to that again if you have a chance. We just reminded people back then, as we will tonight, that there's some things you got to monitor when you get caught in this lockdown because it matters. Monitor your relationships. Monitor the people that you're connected to. If if you're not connected to enough people, you need to. Um, like, uh, these, this won't be the last lockdown. This won't be the last wave. I know people keep saying, oh, it's just a little bit longer. So it, it, realistically, it's not just a little bit longer. <laughs> it never has been. You know, and there's, there's the hopes that people have put in, in different things have, have been dashed every time. What you need is community, and you're going to need that desperately moving forward. And I want to remind you of that. We are going to be distanced more and more all the time, and it's important that you have those connections. Monitor what's coming into your heart and into your mind. Is it truth? Is it truth? Really, is it truth? L- dig, dig in and look up what you're, what you're allowing into your minds. You know, what you watch on television, is that truth? And what are, you, what are you measuring it against? So, so important because what, what comes out of your life is the other thing we said to monitor. And it's, it's, a, it's a result of what's actually taking root in your heart. Man, I've been listening to my own words and listening to my own thoughts and the feelings that are going through my life. It's a revealer of what's in, in our hearts. Last week I simply shared this that in Acts 20 verse 28, Paul, his encouragement to the leaders of the church was this, guard yourselves and guard God's people. Guard yourselves and guard God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, his gathering. They've been purchased with his blood. They're valuable, and that is you tonight, and that is me. Guard yourself and guard his people. The Holy Spirit has appointed you as a leader, and I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, and they won't spare the flock, so guard yourselves. You know, I have to say the guarding yourself part was what really came to mind for me this week. Last week, my heart was like, man, I just have this burden for our church. You know, like little chicks to say, I just want to speak truth for your protection, for your protection. And and I hope you could see that coming through last week. But this week, even just realizing, man, I got to guard myself too, because the enemy never takes a day off. He doesn't take a minute off. Just plaguing the mind with, you know, like lots of different things. The, the fear of what people think, the, just the fear of the future, just fear-based anything. He's going to try and get in there. But just because you have fear in your mind doesn't mean you've lost the battle. It's just that reminder that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That God, you've not given me a spirit of fear, but a love, power, and a sound mind. Satan, you have no business in my mind, so take a hike. <laughs> We're ready for you. We're sorting out truth. We're armored up. Somebody had sent that prayer. I'm praying that our church would be armored up. And man, that was my prayer for us tonight. So thank you. Thank you, June, for that. Last week, you know, really was on my heart, Romans 12, verse 2. Uh, we read it in the message. Don't be over, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. And, 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 and tonight, I guess I just want to share heart to heart part two. So, you know, I, I, my, my prayer is that you would hear his voice. My prayer is that it would stir up something in you in some way that you would dig in to this idea of really thinking about what's going on right now in our world. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking, that you're just going with the flow wherever it's going. Instead, fix your attention on God. I can promise you that oftentimes when you fix your attention on God, it's going to be counter to what the culture is doing. You'll be changed from the inside out is what he says. Your mind will be renewed and changed, and so will you. Readily recognize what he wants from you and then quickly respond to it. And just even reading this, just a reminder again for us, that as we feel what the what Holy Spirit desires for us to do individually and corporately as a church, that we would respond to that, which is part of my heart to heart. Some have said, you know, like, Mark, you often just, you know, get up there and you just preach your opinions about stuff. That, that's, that's, not, that's not my hope. 
That, that's not really what I'm trying to do here. And I, and I hope tonight that that, 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 that that comes through. When I read through Scripture, and, and you know, read the New Testament, I read about guys like Paul. Paul writing to the Jesus followers. And what did he write to them? What were his letters about? He's like, hey, here's the world you live in right now. <laughs> this, is how I, this is how you need to live in this culture. James did the same. John did the same. Like if you read through their letters, 1 John, he wrote to them and said, hey, you're, you're, here's a warning to you. You live to this specific group of people. And as just a reminder, those things weren't written to us. Those letters were written to those people specifically for that day. And yet they're for us as well today, but not written to us. So if you look at who they were written to, John writes and says, hey, you live in a culture right now where there's this thing called Gnosticism, where these people have these deceptive teachings and deceptive uh, knowledge that they're trying to push that's against the, against the truth. He says, be ready, and, and here's how you combat that. You know, Paul would write to the Galatians and said, hey, you guys in Galatia, you live in a culture that is obsessed with legalism. They're trying to drag you back into Old Testament practice. He's like, you need to be aware of what it, li- it, it is to live in that culture in that time. Paul wrote to the, to the Corinthians, and, and he wrote to them, and it's like, guys, you live in one of the most sensualized cultures in the Roman Empire. You, this is how you need to conduct yourself, and don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You live in a place surrounded by temples, but you are a temple. And I wonder, I wonder if they wrote to us today, what would they write? Because I think it's important to understand that they would have probably written different things to our culture. It's the same truth, but in a different, in a different way. What might have they written if they wrote to the letter? Here's the letter to the church of Balmoral. What would it have sounded like? You know, I wonder if maybe they would have wrote about, you know, there's a warning of you live in a culture of division. Kingsway Church, you live and you're living in a culture of division that is so divided on everything. Not just in the church, but everywhere. It's division by race, division by gender, division by thoughts on gender, division by politics, division by opinion, division by truth, which we talked about last week. My truth, your truth, yeah, let's, let's, let's separate. We don't want to come together around the truth. Let's just each have our own, and there's division. But you know, to be honest, I think this generation has come to that, has come to that divisiveness. Um, you know, uh, um, in uh, we come by it honestly, I guess. And here's why I would say that: because for most of them, the division is all in the name of virtue. It's all in the name of virtue, you know, or value. Um, back in the back in the day. You know, well before I was in school, they would teach the seven virtues. The seven virtues that were prudence, the justice, temperance, courage. And then the, they called those the cardinal. And then there was the, the, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. And they would teach children to live these virtues out in their life. And then those got removed And instead of being completely removed, where people in their own hearts would hunger for virtue, they got replaced with these things that we would call pseudo-virtues. Dr. Louis Marcos, in his book called Myth Made Fact, he just said they've replaced those with pseudo-virtues like tolerance, egalitarianism, which is this idea of equality for everyone, inclusivism, multiculturalism, and environmentalism. That's we, we live for these things. And what we find as a result... You know, the true virtues, you can stretch them to any length, and they'll never do harm. But a pseudo-virtue, you stretch it too far. The seed might have been planted in a good idea, but it bears a bitter fruit. You know, individualism is being lost, if not completely lost already. It's lost to the identity of the group you're a part of. It doesn't matter who you are as an individual. It's what group are, are they connected to. You know, things that have been done in the name of justice are leading to hatred and, and murders and things in the name of, of, of justice, but it leads to division. And it's not just out in the world. It's not just, you know, down in the States where, where all these shootings are happening and these, these court cases. It's, it's, not, it's not just there. The, the truth is it actually has found its way into the church. <laughs> I, don't know if you've, I don't know if you heard this, um, but just recently there's a best-selling prayer book. It's on the bestsellers list. It's called A Rhythm of Prayer. The rhythm of prayer, it, it has this prayer in it. As you read through, it has this prayer in it. Dear God, help me hate white people, or at least want to hate them. At least I want to stop caring about them, individually and collectively. I want to stop caring about their misguided, racist souls, to stop believing that they can be better, and that they can even stop being racist. 
How, how, how is that? How, how can that even happen? That a prayer to the God who is love asking that he would help them hate. That if a person is white, then they're guaranteed to be racist. There's no other possibility because that is the group they've been put in. You know, it changes things. And when you look at it a little further, Rob Dreyer in his um, book, Live Not By Lie, simply said it this way. If we've become so polarized in this that, that the group, whatever group you're part of, you know, there's the oppressed and then there's the oppressors. That a white Christian man who's living on disability in a trailer park in the South, he's an oppressor. But if there's a, a black, lesbian, Ivy League professor with a great job, great money, they're oppressed simply be based on the group that they're a part of. It's a head-scratcher for sure. But that's the culture that we're living in right now, that you don't even have a chance to say, hey, this is, <laughs> this is where I'm coming from. And I maybe experienced that last week watching, where it's, it's that desperate plea to say, please see me. Please see an individual. I'd encourage you when you're in, in meeting and connecting with people or you're hearing things, would you, would you strive to see the individual? Because before we're too quick to judge that author, do we harbor hatred in our own hearts for others based on that same principle, based on the group? <laughs> they're a protester. They're an anti-masker. You know, they're a virtue signaler. They're from the right. They're from the left. They're from this church. They're from that church. They, 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 whatever it may be. Whatever it may be, do we do it? Because in the end, all I see is the fruit is just more division. And is that what Christ wants? To the Jesus followers tonight, is that what Christ wants? You know, I can tell you it isn't. You know, when Jesus was being accused of using demonic power to deal with demons, in Mark chapter 3, Mark, uh, Mark writes down, as Peter would have been there for this story, probably was the one who explained it to Mark who wrote it, and he just wrote this. He says, if a kingdom, this is what Jesus said, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand Division leads to the inability to stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house can't stand. Speaking of, you know, in a nation, if a nation's divided, it's going to break. And if, if a home is divided, that home is going to break. And it's that whole idea of if everybody's at everybody, the writing's on the wall, that they will not be able to stand. You know, he would later pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. I think this is one of the most amazing parts of scripture when I can read that Jesus prayed for me. And if you're a follower of Jesus tonight, he, he, he prayed for you. Right before he went to the cross, here's what he prayed. He's like, I'm praying not only for these disciples, you know, his 12 or 11 that were left. He says, but now I'm praying also for all who will ever believe. If you're a believer, that's you. He's like, I'm praying. I'm praying um, that whoever believes in me through these others' message, I pray that they will be one. Father, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I, I'm in you. I want them to be so connected, so connected, and that, that the world will believe that you sent me. You know, it says today that Jesus is still praying for us. He's at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. I, I, I love that. If you could have somebody praying for you, who better than, than Jesus himself? And his hope, and I believe his prayer today would still be that you would be unified around him. That Jesus' followers, we would be unified around him. We may disagree on other things, but that we'd be connected around him. I, I was listening to Matt Chandler this week, and he was just simply saying, you can, you can love other believers that bother you. You can love them. You can hate what they're doing. You can hate what they believe about something. But you can love those believers just the same. And our culture has said that, hey, if we're not of the same group, we just hate. We just hate that group. And so I, again, would challenge you to embrace those, those true virtues of living by faith, by trusting God, by, by offering hope to the world, and, and truly living out our decisions based on, based on love. And I encourage myself to do the same. You know, maybe they would have written to the culture and said, you know, hey, Kingsway Church, I just want to write to you that you are living in a culture of fear. That it's so permeated, the culture right now, that it's everywhere. Every news article they read, everything they see online, there, there's this, this fear-based attack on, on, the, on the world right now. And, you know, for fear, fear leads to that fight or flight response. 
You know, and for some, for a lot of us, it's fight first, you know, or that, that terror. But either of those things, both of those lead, again, to, to more division. So the question is, how do, we, how do we live as Jesus followers in a time like this? And, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy to encourage him in, in the time that he was living. He said, you know what, Timothy? For God has not given you a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Yeah, I know you live in a culture of fear, but God didn't give that to you. No, no, but but he, not only did he not give you fear, I mean, he replaced it was he replaced his fear with something so powerful. His very spirit on the inside of you. The spirit of love that when you don't feel loving, he loves through you. That that his spirit, that inner strength is what he says. Draw on that inner strength, Timothy, because you're gonna feel weak at times. Fear makes you weak, but draw on that and self-control. <laughs> Tim, when you just want to like, uh fight or flight in response, that, that, that just that, that, that self-control of his spirit on you. And to be honest, I need that tonight. I truly need that tonight. That wrestle with fear, that battle with fear, <laughs> the enemy's not going to give up. It doesn't matter how many times until we, until we, by the spirit of Christ, kick him in the teeth and say, no, no more. No, no more fear. No more fear. I, I, you know, even, even that, 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 that virtue of courage, the courage isn't the absence of fear, but it's that you do the right thing in the presence of fear. That she would do the, pre- the right thing in the presence of fear. And you know, the right thing and the easy thing, they're rarely the same thing. Sometimes that's what it takes. And Kingsway, I call on you in this moment for that as well. You know, that we would be part of the solution in a world right now that has no other option. No other option when fear is ruling. And it's fear that I believe is based on lies. That's, that's We talked about a number of weeks ago, you know, to live not by lies because that's where fear finds its root in our lives. And so I, I just simply wanted to challenge you with some things. And, and I know, like, I, I think that, that I'm not asking you to believe this because I say so. I'm simply asking you, would you dig into this and see if this is, if this is truth or not? You know, the, to look up the other side of the story because we're getting pounded with one side of the story all of the time. And before I jump in, because I know this is such a sensitive topic, and I know that, you know, people are dealing with loved ones who are hospitalized right now with COVID. Man, as a church, would you continue to pray? Would you continue to lift up guys like Mike Vanetten? Would you continue to lift up the Wabenga family? You know, we're seeing good signs there. Would you, would you continue to pray? for them. That's what we're called to do as a church. That there's no, there's no sides that we, we're in this. We're in this together. But can I simply say that, that there's a side of the story that we, we aren't told. Right now we're told we're in this massive wave and, and the numbers that came out from the models are like, we could see up to 30,000 cases a day and it's this terror of 30,000 cases a day. Can, can, I, can I show you a graph tonight? Here's a graph that just shows the simple numbers of what ha- what's happened so far in one year. And, and all, all, I, all I want you to notice is the blue line is the cases, the waves. And man, they, 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 they're, they're, they're big, man. You can surf these things. But if you look at the daily deaths, why, why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they going with the waves? Because I believe that we're being fed lies. Not that COVID's not deadly. COVID is deadly. It's deadly to a certain group of people. And I feel like those people, that group of people, I'm going to talk about this tonight, they've been sort of left out in the cold, just being left vulnerable. They're being left vulnerable under the guise of protection, but being left vulnerable. Do you know, so, you know here's some truths to look up. Do you know that we actually cannot stop a respiratory virus from spreading? We can't stop it. There's, you know, we can, we can slow it down with lockdowns, and there's some calling for stricter lockdowns. If we just lock down stricter, we'll get rid of COVID. Can I tell you, we will never get rid of COVID that way. You can't. Just look that up. It's not, it's not scientifically possible. You know, we're going to have to learn how to live with COVID. C.S. Lewis said something to this effect, that, that people get so preoccupied with extending their life that they're willing to give up living in the process. So, so preoccupied with extending life and protection and safety that they're not actually living. And you know what? There's Canadians all over. There's people sitting in their homes not, not living. Did you know that uh, the truth is that, that masks, they don't actually protect you from COVID-19? And that truth is out there everywhere, but we, we don't see it. 
Just look at the next time you go to a store. Read the packaging of the masks. Every one of them, the surgical masks, every cloth mask, it'll say right on there, this will not protect you from COVID-19. And yet we're told, wear all these masks to, to give this false sense of security. As I thought about that, I mean, I thought about friends of mine who are very vulnerable, who've had lung surgeries, beat lung cancer, and, 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 and would be told, to, hey, walk around with this mask on and it'll protect you from COVID-19. The truth is that improper use of a mask actually leads to bacterial infections that are just as deadly. But they don't tell you those truths. If you've got a vulnerability, to be honest, the safest thing you can do is an N95 or even better when you're out in public because every other one isn't going to protect you. And that's a truth, but you, you're, not, you're not told. No wonder it's spread so fast and even through, through people that have, have tested positive and said, well, I wear my mask all the time. Truth. Who's the most vulnerable? Who are the most vulnerable? You know, the recent modeling that we've heard makes it sound like it's going to get everybody. It's going to get, you know, 30,000 a day. It is a super duper deadly virus for all. But the question is, is it really? Truthfully, it's very deadly for some, but who's it? But, but not, it's not deadly for most. It's truly not deadly for most. We saw the, 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 the last slide with the huge cases and that tiny line at the bottom because all of those cases, they're going to make it. They're going to make it. You know, if you want to know the vulnerability, I just want to show you. I showed you this chart uh, in December, but let me show you this other one. This is the same one. You know, your chances, your chances of recovery from COVID-19, like age 19 and under, 99.99%. You know, under the age of 40, 99.99%. Like, that's, that's all health levels and everything. You're going you're gonna to make it. You know, fear wants to say, oh, if we get it, what's going to happen to us? Under the age of 60, 99.7% chance. This is statistics based on a whole year plus. This is the actual COVID. This is what it's really done. 99. And you're like, what about variants? We this is with a whole bunch of variants still, 99.7. If you're under the age of 80, you got 96.2% chance of beating COVID. Like, <laughs> the stats are in your favor. And, and I know now you're like, yeah, but the hospitals are full and there's young people in the hospital. And I just have to say, I am grateful for our healthcare workers. Super grateful. And they're discovering things that are helping people beat it. But we, we know people that work in, in, in healthcare. You know, the, even watching some of these other doctors that get canceled. Do you know what they've said? Even Bill Maher from uh, whatever he's from, he even said these things too. Do you know what, the, do you know what the, the, the main vulnerabilities for young people are? Is if they're obese. And we don't like to talk about that because it's like, oh, let's not talk about sensitive things. But if we don't talk about sensitive things, people die. And so the truth is, for younger people, here's the ones that end up on ventilators. Most of them are obese have diabetes, have a previous heart condition or previous respiratory convictions or are smokers. How, if any of those categories fit you, yes, you should be extra concerned or, or, or at least concerned. But for everybody else, healthy, younger people, you're not at risk, not at risk of dying. Yeah, you're at risk of getting it. The spread, how does it spread? You know, so worried about surfaces and hand sanitizing everything. You know, the Center for Disease Control just recently put out that the, the chance of getting it from a surface is now 1 in 10,000. 1 in 10,000. I, I like those chances. You know, the outdoor transmission, you know, so people are all concerned about these super spreader events that are happening outside and are so, so angry about that. The, the, the research shows us that the spread at those outdoor events is exceedingly small. In some places, it's one-tenth of a percent. In whole countries like Ireland, one-tenth of a percent is what's spread outside. But will you look up that truth? Will you look up that truth? And then finally, here's my question. Why aren't doctors telling people, why isn't our main doctors telling people to do healthy things? We don't read in the news about things like, hey, get outside because it's good for you. COVID doesn't like the sun and it doesn't like the wind. Get out there. Get outside. Exercise. You know, all those extra pounds you put on while you were, you know, watching Netflix during the last kind of lockdowns? Those aren't good for you. You know, 
Take vitamin D to help your immune system. It's not a magical drug, but it's one of the main reasons why so many people are immunocompromised. And this we rarely see on the news. And this is where, this is where I ask these questions. Why are fast food and LCBO and cigarette companies still wide open? And gyms are closed, and you can't get in to see a counselor, and AA groups are, you know, from many parts closed as well. <laughs> Will you look into that truth? Will you look into that and see? Because the question is, we see who's vulnerable, but you know who else is vulnerable? Who else is vulnerable right now? Kids, children and teens, they have zero risk, zero risk of dying of COVID. Under age 40 really has zero risk, maybe 0.1% risk of dying from COVID. But they're vulnerable to so much right now. Talked about it last week, Mac Hospital, saying the kids, the suicide rates are three times what they were last year in the first four months. Their mental health, their education, the suicide rates. You know, in young families, this is so hard. On single moms, so hard. Marriages in trouble. Marriages in trouble as a result of the financial, the, the depression. Addicts are in trouble. They're all vulnerable right now. But we don't hear about that. And that's why I think the church is so essential. We've been told we're not essential. You can just, you know, go and do your, you know, 10-person thing. And I believe we're essential not because we don't care about human life, but because we do care about human life. That I'll tell you tonight, the, if you know anybody in the list that I said is vulnerable, protect them. Use wisdom to protect them. And then also realizing that we're going to care about the rest. And some people would say, like, well, don't you care about the first responders and adding to that? <sighs> yes, I do. But I also feel like I am a first responder. When I have to be there for, for marriages, when I'm on the phone with people who are going through just difficult times, when I have to tell people, hey, the church can't be open this week, and they're like, that is my lifeline. <laughs> Kingsway, we, maybe other churches aren't, but we are. We are. I believe we're a hospital for the mental health of people, for the emotional health of people. Man, to see a smile for the relational health, for the marital health, for the moral and spiritual health. Man, that's what the church was meant to be. You know, Jesus explained it to his first century audience, and he said, you know what? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He said, he's anointed me to do what? To bring good news to the poor. <laughs> to, uh, to send me to proclaim that captives will be released, that blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And we've got people everywhere who need some good news right now. And just stuck in this culture of fear. Do you know that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, it says he lives in you? He lives in me? That you've been commissioned to spread good news? You've been commissioned not to just, you know, oh, hey, I'm going to kind of do church because that's what, you, you, you are the church in the world. You know, people are asking like, yeah, can't you just do it over Zoom? To all those watching online, raise your hand if you're like the, being on Zoom more than being together. Well, I can't even see your hands. <laughs> I can't even see your hands. For some, they're like, yeah, we can do this, but let me ask you this. Are you thriving? Are you thriving on your own in your home watching? Or are you simply surviving? And for some, some, some of the introverts are like, man, I am thriving, and this is great for me, and I, I'm glad of that. I'm glad of that. But my question is, have we considered all of those who aren't, who absolutely need to be in community. You know, for those with kids, I know it doesn't work real well with kids. You know, I was talking with a guy who had to meet a counselor online. He's like, man, I just wish I could talk to somebody face to face. Why? Because we were designed that way. We're so much more than biology. You know, as we talk about the idea of can we gather, well, the, the Charter of Rights and Freedom says that, yes, you can gather. That's a, that's a right, and it's legit, but let me just say this, one of our small group sessions, we've, they talked about that, and it's a brilliant thought that with rights come responsibility. You know, we, we can't just decide as a church, we're just going to stand up for our rights, and that's what we're going to do, because that's not what Jesus would do. But that great responsibility comes with those rights and, and with those freedoms. And, you know, it's not about us and our desires of, well, we just like it better. But can I tell you, something powerful happens when people gather. And something detrimental happens when people are separated from one another for long periods of time. My hope, my prayer is that this place would be a place of healing. A place of healing that we would honor God with what he created the church to be. 
that we would stand up for truth and we would stand up for the gospel and we would stand up for his gathering. Some were said, can you wait a few weeks? Can you just like wait till this next, you know, lockdown's over? Wait till, you know, wait a few more months or you know, may, might as well say, hey, you're going to wait a couple years. And I just think that Jesus didn't call us to be the city on a hill when everything is going fine. Or that you be the light of the world when it's super bright and everything's hunky-dory. He's like, nah, the city on the hill, it can't be hidden ever. The light that shines, it shines all the time, especially when it's dark. You know, I, I read this um, thing by a guy named George Mueller. George Mueller was a man who lived a, a long time ago. And he started these, um, he started these orphanages in, in England. And uh, I just want to read to you uh, uh, just a short portion of the book of his life. It says this, Cholera spread like wildfire, killing thousands of people. This is in Bristol. George and Henry Craig were called out at all hours of the day and night to pray for those who had been stricken with the disease. Those who caught it, they usually died quickly. Often it took only 12 hours from the time a person first began to feel sick and started vomiting to the time he or she was laid in a coffin. That is, if a coffin could be found. The work was exhausting, and it seemed like it would never end. All through July and August, bodies piled up on the sidewalks, waiting for carts to carry them away. Often they lay there rotting for a week or more because the cart driver himself had died of the disease and it was difficult to find someone brave enough to replace him. Everyone knew that the best chance for staying healthy was to keep away from other people, especially large groups of people where the disease could spread quickly. However, the folks at the two chapels wanted to continue meeting together to comfort and to encourage one another. So George and Henry agreed with them. And so they held a prayer meeting each morning to ask God to spare them and to stop this epidemic. Often, two or three hundred people would ignore the risks of meeting together and show up to be led in prayer by George or Henry. And even though they prayed earnestly, the church bells in the city continued to toll for the funerals. It was hard for George as he trudged from one end of the Bristol to the other. This young pastor was welcomed into any house that he stopped at. Even total strangers reached out to grab him as he walked by, and George would read the Bible aloud to them and pray for the dying. Or he would comfort a hysterical widow who now had no way to feed her ragged, hollow-cheeked children. Mary Mueller was fighting her own battle. Every morning she watched her husband walk out the door and into danger, and each time George reached out to hold the hand of a dying child or help a woman lay her husband's dead body out uh, or, or, or hug a little child, he was exposing himself to cholera. What if you get sick? Mary asked him, have you, have you thought of that? And George nodded silently. Of course. He thought of it a thousand times. Every meal could easily be his last, especially given the number of people he touched who were dying. But I have to do it, Mary. Someone has to help these people and let them know that God cares. And what about me, Mary pleaded. Does God not care about me and our little one? There's nothing to guarantee that you'll even be alive to see it born. And she wiped away the tears with the corner of her apron as she spoke. I know. I know, said George soothingly. But Mary, you can't imagine me hiding inside my own house where there are people who need God's comfort and the little I can do for them, can you? Mary shook her head. No, she agreed quietly. That would not be the man I married. On September 16, George did stay home all day, to assist the midwife with the birth of his baby daughter, Lydia. In spite of all the death around them, Lydia was thriving. She was a thriving, healthy baby, and by the time she was a month old, the cholera epidemic had finally run its course. A huge service of thanksgiving was held at the Gideon Chapel, and of the 200 people who regularly attended the two chapels, only one had died. I think, what a powerful story. <laughs> people facing a pandemic much, much more deadly than what we're in right now. That heart for people and that heart for God to say, I put my life on the line to reach out to people. There's that responsibility, that responsibility to do, not to be reckless, but to simply be aware, to simply be aware that there's people who need that hope and they need truth and they need comfort and they need encouragement. They truly need it. Will we be that church? I'll leave you with final thoughts. If the spirit of this law that we're under right now is safety, 
if that's the purpose of it is safety. My question is, how do we honor and how can we honor that law and still effe- be, uh, and, and effectively be his gathering? How do, how do we find that? Can we find ways to make sure that it's safe, that, the, that, that for vulnerable people, <laughs> that we, for the non-vulnerable, we create these safe environments? Is that possible? But I also ask this question, and I have to think it, and it's, it's one of the reasons, but what if, what if the purpose of this law isn't safety? What if that's not really the reason? And I wonder, because I look at all of Ontario being shut down when there's places up north that are stay-at-home orders who have no cases of COVID anywhere near them. Is it for their safety? C.S. Lewis said, once people stop believing in God, the problem is not that they will believe in nothing. Rather, the problem is that they will believe in anything. And right now, I can easily see a world, including a church, that would be tempted to just go along with culture where it's going. That they would trust a man to be their protector. Everybody stay at home. That they would trust a man to be their healer. I'll take the vaccine. That they would trust a man to be their provider. Universal basic income, sign me up. And unfortunately, that they would trust a man to be their master. And as Jesus followers, we've been called to have a different master. A master that we are to obey. A master who started the church and said, this is, I'm going to set my gathering and the gates of hell won't stand against it. And that gathering will take the good news to the world. The gathering is important. My concern rests with this. Who do we trust? Who do we trust? Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, as I saw it on the tagline of an email, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will direct your paths. Can I just simply say that our board and our leadership team and our church, we've been praying about this. God, that we would trust you and that you would lead our steps. God, that we would trust you and that you would lead our steps. That we would be the light that shines in this day and age. That we would be the city on a hill, whatever that looks like. We'll let you know this week via email some of the stuff that where, where we feel we're headed. But I wanted to encourage you with these words tonight. And finally... <laughs> Finally, sometimes I feel like I'm the only one. When I read this quote by C.S. Lewis, when the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. When everyone in the world is running towards a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. And maybe that's what you think right now. And I'm okay. I think as long as we can stay connected around Jesus... We're okay. But I feel obligated to speak this truth because I also believe that there's a greater virus at work in the world, one that none escapes. It's a virus called sin. (laughs) Sin's infected every person on the planet. It affects every one of us. Maybe you're watching, you're not a Jesus follower. It's sin that causes the brokenness. It's sin that causes sickness. It's sin that makes you, you know, feel like, man, I don't have purpose and I can't, I, I feel empty all the time. Sin has broken us, broken us deeply. We can't even live up to our own standards. We use like, I, I, I never should have done this, or I, ne- I should have done that, and we can't, even, we can't even keep our own standards. Far less whatever God would have required of us. And there's this fear of death that's so rampant everywhere. Why? Because I believe one day we know that we will give an account of our lives before our maker, that we will meet him on the day we depart this earth. Are we ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Maybe for you, you say, you know what, I feel... I feel like I'm broken. I know I am. I know that I'm broken in need of repair, that I'm lost and I'm in need of rescue, that I truly am a sinner and I need forgiveness and I need hope. Well, the truth is tonight there is hope. There is hope. And that hope is found in, <laughs> in, in, not in prayer. It's not found in a religion. It's found in a person and his name is Jesus. And he wants to rescue you. He simply said, if you admit that you're a sinner and reach out and put your trust in me, My death on the cross will pay all of the penalty of the past. I'll wash it all away. I'll forgive it all. I'll give you a brand new start. I'll give you a hope and a future. And I'll give you an eternal future with me. The goodness of God. The goodness of God. I I pray that you answer that call if you feel it on the inside tonight. And to the Jesus followers, I pray that we remain united around Christ, regardless of where we fall on any of these other things that we would choose to love one another and that we would be the church that's courageous in the face of fear. 
and that we would do that for the world around us. I pray tonight you've heard his voice. If there's words of mine that, <laughs> I just pray they fall to the ground and forgotten, but that whatever he said to you grips you here and bears the fruit that he desires for your life. I pr pray this in his name. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. God, thank you <laughs> for the truth of your word. You haven't given us a spirit of fear. God, that your heart burns and breaks for a world that's lost, that you've poured out that love in our hearts. God, I pray for my Kingsway family that are suffering tonight. By being isolated, I pray for them. God, may your presence fill their homes right now. Would you fill their rooms? Would they have such a sense of you? And would they relish in that relationship connection they can have with you just right now tonight? God, I pray that as we trust you, you would lead us individually and as a church. That individually in every home right now, they would just hear your prompting and your leading in their lives. Oh, God. Oh, thank you that we do not have to go through life alone. Father, I lift up, I lift up those who are sick right now. God, we pray for them. We ask for your healing power over their lives. We ask that, that what the enemy meant for evil, that you would bring good out of it. God, I pray that you would be glorified through, through the stories and the testimonies. I pray that people would come to know you as a result, that they would see the, the temporary status of life and reach out to the giver of life. And Father, I pray for our leaders. God, I pray for our country's leaders that they would see you for who you are, that they would surrender their lives and their agendas to you, Father, I pray. I pray their eyes would be opened and not blinded. God, I pray that they would see that, the, <laughs> uh, that, that your church is essential and work with for the good of this people of this country. I pray that, I ask for that. God, and I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're still with us, we have some questions for you. Some things I would encourage you to just dig down deep. Because the truth is, the Holy Spirit wants to lead you individually. You know, as part of a family, his big family, the church worldwide, this local church, and individually, he has things for you. And I encourage you to listen for his voice and to be courageous and follow it. So here's a couple thoughts. What jumped out at you from today's talk? And second, you know, uh, have you found yourself following culture's lead towards division? I know I have. It's just the easiest way to go. <laughs> have you felt that leading you towards fear? I know I have. It's an easy way to go. And then finally, what do you think God wants the church to be doing in this time? What do you think he wants the church to be doing in this time? And then finally, what do you think he wants you to be doing in this time? And I pray that as he answers that, she would be obedient to whatever that is for his glory, for your good. I'm just thankful that we were able to do this together. Uh, and we will see you soon, I hope. Be blessed. I love you, Kingsway.